the last few lectures we have been discussing how the crystal structure of a solid may be determined using scattering techniques or diffraction techniques and this gives you the information about the position of atoms and molecules inside the crystal. Having done that, we are now in a position to go on to discussing the physical properties of crystals and the role of symmetry in determining these physical properties. So, this will be the subject of our discussion today. All crystals by virtue of their regular periodic arrangement of atoms in three dimensions are anisotropic with respect to their physical properties as we have already mentioned. This means that the physical properties are different in different directions. So, while specifying properties of crystals, it becomes necessary to include information on the directions. For instance, the electrical conductivity of a crystal involves two directions because the electrical conductivity is given by the general relation J equals sigma E, where this is the electrical conductivity which we want to determine. This is the electric field and this is the current density. So, the direction in which the electric field is applied as given by the vector E and the direction in which the current density produced is measured as given by the vector j. These are the two directions both of which have to be specified in order to state what is the value of the conductivity and if these directions are changed the value of the conductivity will be different. So, it is necessary to mention these two directions of the two vector quantities involved in the measurement while specifying the conductivity. Obviously, a single number cannot be used to specify the electrical conductivity of a crystal. This is actually true for many other properties like the magnetic susceptibility, the refractive index etcetera. The question then arises, how to specify the directions regarding the physical property measurements and specifications. Now, in elementary discussions about physical quantities, we have learnt about scalar and vector quantities. For example, we have all been told that the mass is a scalar. So, we specify the mass of an object as for example, so many kilograms. Another quantity which comes to the mind for as an example of a scalar quantity is the temperature. We specify the temperature of an object in degree Celsius or degree Fahrenheit or degree Kelvin and so on. So, there are different units in which these quantities are specified. If instead of kilograms, 
one prefers to use pounds or metric tons, but then we know how the there these various units are related to each other. So, we can uniquely and completely specify the mass n of an object regardless of which system of units we adopt. This is also the case with the temperature, we may specify the temperature in degree Celsius or in the Fahrenheit scale or in the thermodynamic absolute Kelvin scale. But as long as we know how these different values are related to each other, there is no ambiguity regarding what a given object, what is the temperature of it is. So, such quantities like the mass and the temperature are completely specified once their magnitudes are given. Such quantities are example of scalar quantities. In contrast to this, there are other situations in which such a procedure will not be satisfactory. For example, suppose we think of a person who travels in a car with a certain speed, he will end up in different places depending on the direction in which he travels. So, in order to determine the displacement of an object from one point in space to at a given instant of time to another point in space at a subsequent instant of time, it is not just enough to know the speed with which the object has travelled during this interval, but it is also necessary to specify in which direction it is moving. Then only we will have the complete information required to determine the displacement. The displacement, in order to specify the displacement, it is not enough if you just to specify the speed of the object, but also it is necessary to specify the direction of motion. When we specify the speed along with the information about the direction of motion, we refer to this as the velocity. So, the velocity has a magnitude given by the speed and a direction. Such a quantity is known as a vector. So, in dynamics we come across several such quantities such as the displacement, velocity, acceleration, force, linear momentum etcetera. So, these are all vector quantities which have not only a magnitude but also a direction. So, this is something that we are all familiar with. In order to proceed further, in order to be able to talk about quantities like the electrical conductivity, it is necessary for us to know how to specify this direction with respect to a certain fixed coordinate system or a frame of reference. So, the direction has to be specified with respect to such a coordinate system. Suppose, we have a rectangular Cartesian coordinates. Which is with which we are all familiar. Which is specified by a certain origin and then x y z. An origin O and x y z or the axis.
coordinate axis. So, we have something like this. We have this given in figure 4 1, you have O x, O y, O z are the orthogonal directions along the three mutually perpendicular standard directions in three dimensional space and you specify the coordinates of a, an object by specifying a vector for example can then a vector A may be specified by giving its components A x, A y, A z along these three coordinate axes. So, that and the unit vectors along these are given as E x, E y, E z respectively, then the vector A may be written as E x A x plus E y A y plus E z A z. It is fairly well known, it is straightforward to know that the magnitude of this vector is just the square root of the sum of squares of these components a x square plus a y square plus a z square to the power half, that is the magnitude. So, in general for more general representations, it is more convenient to drop the suffixes x, y and z and replace them by a 1, a 2, a 3 by which we understand that the symbol subscripts 1, 2, 3 stand for the x, y and z components. So, that I can write the same relation as a 1 square plus a 2 square plus a 3 square to the power half. And this one, we can write this relation as e 1 a 1 plus e 2 a 2 plus e 3 a 3. The advantage of this notation will become obvious when we introduce what is known as the summation convention. Which was introduced by Einstein. According to this convention, Whenever a particular subscript is repeated, it implies a summation over that subscript. For example, we can write this using the summation convention as E i A i, where i is 1, 2, 3. Since i is repeated, this means that there is a summation. So, even a 1 plus e 2 a 2 plus e 3 a 3, where i runs over 1 2 3. And similarly, the magnitude square is a i square or a i a i. Again, since i is repeated, this means that there is a summation over these indices. So, I have a 1 a 1 which is a 1 square plus a 2 a 2 which is a 2 square plus a 3 a 3 which is a 3 square giving us again the same expression. But, we have arrived at a much more 
compact notation in both cases. So, this notation enables us to generalize this considerations to more complex physical quantities which are in general known as tensors. In order to know what these tensors mean, let us go back to these two vector quantities which are related to each other. Just to make life more interesting, let us take a different, a similar but different relation which relates the electric polarization P, which is a vector to the applied electric field E. And the relation is the, these two quantities, the polarization and the electric field are related via the so called electric susceptibility. This is the electric polarization. This is very similar to this relation, but I am just for interest sake, I am taking a different example. So, in general P and E, which are vectors will not have the same direction. Therefore, it is necessary to specify their directions. So, then I will have P 1 equals chi E 1. Let me write this relation, then explain. So, the electric field is applied in a general direction such that it has components E 1, E 2 and E 3 along the three coordinate axis in a chosen reference frame. So, the component P 1 of the polarization vector which is along the x direction is given is due to not only E 1, but also E 2 and E 3. Therefore, we have to write this general relationship between P and E in terms of a sum which includes the contribution due to the polarization produced by the component E 1 and the contribution from E 2 and the contribution from E 3 using the principle of superposition. So, the contribution from E 1 to P 1 is known as the component chi 1 1 and the contribute which means that this is the contribution due to the electric field component E 1 for the polarization component P 1. Similarly, the contribution from the component E 2 to the polarization component P 1 is chi 1 2. So, there are two subscripts now for each of these quantities, one subscript indicating which component of the polarization it is contributes to and the other subscript indicating due to which component of the electric field it arises. Similarly, I will have other relations like P 2 equal to chi 2 1 P 1 plus chi 2 2 P 2 plus chi 2 3 E 3 and P 3 is chi 3 1 E 1 plus chi 3 2 E 2 plus chi 3 3 E 3. Those are the that gives you the all the three components of the polarization vector, which arise from contributions from the three components E 1, E 2, E 3 of the electric field. So, this set of quantities chi 1 1, chi 1 2, chi 1 3, chi 2 1, chi 2 2, 
chi 2 3, chi 3 1, chi 3 2, chi 3 3. This entire set of quantities together determine the total response to the electric field, the polarization produced by the electric field. This looks very complicated, but I can use my sum, sum, summation convention and write this as a very compact relationship in this way. Where I runs over 1, 2, 3, j also runs over 1, 2, 3. So, I use since I have chi i j e j, the subscript j, there is a repetition. So, there is a summation over the subscript j. So, this really means as I substitute, this is going to give me, this is really the following p i equals chi i 1 e 1 plus chi i 2 e 2 plus chi i 3 e 3. And if I give the values i for i from 1, 2, 3, I will get back all these three relationships. So, this compact relationship is really a very compact way to represent this complex relationship. And the entire array of chi's together all the nine coefficients, they form the components of a tensor known as the electric susceptibility tensor. Similarly, the electrical conductivity is also a tensor. We could use for example, instead of the algebraic notation, this immediately suggests the possibility to write this in matrix form. Using the method of matrix multiplication, we get back the same relationship. So, the column matrix P 1, P 2, P 3 that gives you the components of the column com components of the vector P, while the column matrix here E 1, E 2, E 3 gives us the components of the vector E. And this 3 by 3 matrix consisting of the array of numbers chi 1, 1 etcetera up to chi 3, 3 that gives you a 3 by 3 matrix which represents the electric susceptibility tensor. So, that is the general way to represent quantities of this kind. So, you can see already it is not a just a tensor, it is a tensor of rank 2. A vector is a tensor of rank 1, a scalar is a tensor of rank 0. What does this mean? This means in three dimensional space, if you raise this to the power 0, 3 to the power 0, which is 1, a scalar has just one component, it is one quantity. If you specify the magnitude of the tensor, scalar, you have everything about the scalar. Whereas, this one has 3 to the power 1, which is 3 components, a vector quantity has 3 components and a tensor of rank 2 has 3 square 9 components as shown here for example. So, it is clear that we can have depending on what are the quantities involved in this relationship, 
you can have even tensors of rank 3, rank 4 and so on, higher order tensor. For example, elastic modulus. Elastic modulus everyone knows is given by a relation connecting the stress and the strain. So, the relation connecting the stress is a tensor of rank 2. A strain is also a tensor of rank 2. So, the elastic modulus is a tensor of rank 4, which means that it has 3 to the power 4 in general equal to 81 components. Let us get back to the conductivity tensor specified by this relationship and uh, we know that if we have these conductivity tensor and then suppose I apply the electric field along a particular coordinate axis. So, then only that component will be non-zero. For example, E 1 is non 0, but E 2 and E 3 are 0, in which case we will simply have J 1, J 2, J 3. So, this will have only 3 components which are non 0, but if the electric field is applied along an arbitrary direction, then all the 9 components will be non 0. These 9 components are written for example, likewise in the more compact notation j i equals sigma i j e j, where i and j run over 1, 2 and 3. The uh, summation convention enables us to skip the summation symbol. As I already told you, it is very important to specify the directions. These directions are specified with respect to a fixed reference frame or coordinate system, but very often in real life, we may frequently go from one type of coordinate system to another. For example, we may want to know how a given object is moving inside an elevator as compared to the motion relative to the fixed earth terra firma. So, we would like to know how these two are related. The elevator provides one set of coordinates, while the fixed earth outside gives you another coordinate system or a reference frame and it is very necessary for us to know how the different quantities transform when we go from one set of coordinates to another. This requires a knowledge of how different physical quantities transform when there is a change in the reference frame. In this figure shows a change, a simple change affected by a simple rotation about the z axis by an amount theta. So, it is fairly straightforward to see that if you have a scalar quantity, since it has only a magnitude, the magnitude should not change under coordinate transformations. So, a scalar quantity is one which remains invariant under coordinate transformations. So, we are talking about coordinate transformations now. And we have seen that a scalar quantity is invariant with respect to a change in the reference frame. For example, the mass of an object or the temperature of an object 
are not determined by what coordinate system we use to specify this. So, that is what we mean by saying that the scalar quantity is invariant under coordinate transformations, but this is not the case for vector and other tensor quantities. A vector changes in magnitude and direction. For example, one of the simplest examples is the position vector. So, we show the position vector under a coordinate transformation and we specify the position vector in terms of its components x prime, y prime and x y in the two reference frames, which are obtained by a rotation about the z axis. Since the, the rotation is about the z axis, the z coordinate remains the same, though, so we do not specify the z coordinate, it is the same. So, we can simply write z prime equal to z, whereas the x prime and y prime are obviously related by things like this, equations of this form. These are the transformation equations, which describe the transformation of the components x prime, y prime and z prime under a coordinate transformation namely rotation by an angle theta about the z axis. So, this can also be straight away written in matrix form. So, we can use this basic idea of a coordinate transformation from a basis x y z to another basis x prime y prime z prime by a general notation of what is known as a linear transformation. So, these equation, this equation describes such a linear transformation, which can in general be written even in a more general form as a 1 1, a 1 2, a 1 3, a 2 1, a 2 2, a 2 3, a 3 1, a 3 2, a 3 3 x y z where the a i j s constitute an array of 9 numbers, which specify the direction cosines of the new coordinate axis with respect to the old coordinate axis. Or in our compact in summation, summation notation, repeat, subscript notation, I can write a i j x j that is a linear transformation from the coordinate basis x j to the basis x i prime where the a i j s constitute the coefficients of the transformation, which give you the connection between the x j and the x i prime. Again the repeated summation, the repeat repetition of the subscript j implies summation as can be seen here from this, from this one.
So, this can be used even though we have written it for the components of the position vector, this can be straight away taken over to specify the components of any arbitrary vector or tensor of rank 1. And we can say that the components of any vector a i prime t i j to keep the distinction between the direction cosines of a position vector, but these are these are the components, these are the coefficients which relate the components a j and a i prime involved in the transformation. So, this defines the transformation rule. for a vector, the components of a vector, which is a tensor of rank 1. So, now we can generalize to the case of the transformation rule governing the any higher order tensor. So, we can here itself for example, T i j as we already saw, since it connects two vector quantities, T i j should be a second rank tensor. So, we can now generalize and find out what happens to the components T i j of this second rank tensor under a linear transformation of this kind using the same principles. We will do this in the next time.